Good morning, church. Despite the weather condition, we are glad to see everyone, everyone of, of who made yourself to be here this morning at St. John's Church. Uh, this is our first meeting, meeting uh, of the year. It's just worth to remind that our last one was on the 25th of December, 2021. So we have more than reasons to be glad to be here this morning. I am also delighted to welcome our brothers and sisters uh, who are watching us the worship service through our YouTube channel and through our broadcast and VOAR radio station. So our platform today is composed by uh, Leandro Ortega, who is going to help us with this scripture reading. And the, call offering, the offering call is going to be done by Georgina Summerton. And pastoral prayer, the sermon and benedictions by Pastor Jamie Joseph. And the special music, Sarah Joseph. And the song of praise, the second advent. Uh, <clears throat> and I'd like to... Uh, thank you for the piano player today, Judy Morgan. Um, <clears throat> and the, the call to worship reading today is found in Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Although the online service you know, at Zoom you know, has been the best tool or the best way for us to keep, to keep us together and worship in union, into, coming into the house of the Lord is incom incomparable. May the Lord our Jesus Christ keep the fire of his Holy Spirit burning inside of every one of us and help us to fulfill the mission in Newfoundland and throughout the world. I'd like to invite now the song of praise. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Are you happy to be in the house of God this morning? It's been a long time coming, but we are so glad to be worshiping with you in person. And we are so grateful to God for guiding us and keeping us during this time. I pray that you're blessed by our praise and worship.
Happy Sabbath. Just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that we are unpre- that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Thank you. So wonderful to be back in God's house today. Praise the Lord. The uh, offering today is for Newfoundland Advance. A regular and dependable God. 1 Kings, verse 17 to 14. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. We choose to give regularly and systematically because of the regularity of God's care for us. The story of the Shunammite widow's oil and flour testifies loudly about the God whose compassions never fail and are new every morning. Every single day during these three and a half years of famine, there was food on her table. She never missed a single meal. God faithfully realized his promise in response to the widow's action to provide first to Elijah, the man of God. During these days of scarcity, God's miracle was as consistent as dawn. God remains consistent even today. A family had recently settled in a new country and encountered some financial challenges. Their family budget was not balancing. They decided to skim out all superfluous expenses but that was not enough. It was now time for some drastic decisions to either cut their giving to the church or not enroll their son in his piano lessons. Both decisions would be temporary until their financial condition improved. Prayerfully, but painfully, they chose the second option, no piano lessons. A few days later, early in the morning, The wife picked up an envelope from their living room floor. The envelope was sealed and had no name written on it. When they opened the envelope, great was their surprise to find money inside. The amount was more than enough for the fee for at least three months of piano lessons. They experienced the consistency of God's care. Some life circumstances may tempt us to interrupt our regularity in worshiping God with our resources. If this is our struggle, let us allow God's faithfulness and regularity to inspire us. This week, in response to God's consistency, we worship him with our tithe and regular offerings. And just want to mention that the, uh, in the foyer, the uh, offering plate is, uh, you can give while coming in or going out. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the unchanging, eternal God on whom we can depend for our daily substances. Help us to reflect your image of regularity in faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we will have our pastoral prayer and 
If it is possible, I invite you to kneel with me as we say a prayer to the Lord. Father in heaven, there is none like you. God, we are so grateful that we serve you. Lord, we can see that every moment we breathe shows us that you love us. Every moment we are able to see this world and even spend time looking in your word reminds us that you are our creator. You are our sustainer. You are our redeemer. And there is none like you. And Lord, it gives us joy that we can take a moment to pause the busyness of life cares of this world, the trials and tragedies of this world, to spend time speaking with you, to share from our hearts how much we truly adore you. And God, as I speak on behalf of the congregation, Lord, I'm humbled Because, Lord, we all have various needs. And I can never really know what we all need at this specific time. But, Lord, I just ask that you would visit each heart that is here in this church and is watching online. That, Lord, you would hear the groanings of their hearts. That you would hear their thanksgivings. That you would hear their petitions, that you would hear whatever it is they want to say to you, that God, you would not only hear, but that you would answer, that you would minister, that you would respond in a way that only you can. Oh God, I know that as we look in this world, we can see that things are not looking great. We see what the COVID has done, pestilence, and, and even as it seems as though we are heading towards the tail end of the pestilence, we are hearing that more are on the horizon. Lord, as we look in the world, we see what is happening in Ukraine and with Russia. And Lord, our hearts go out to all that is happening. And Lord, we just want to pray for peace. We want to pray, God, that you would intercede on that situation. We pray, God, for ceasefire. We pray, God, for your protection. And Lord, even though we are here, we're not there with them. But Lord, we empathize. We pray that, God, you would intervene. We know by the signs that your coming is near. And so as much as we want the second coming to be hastened, we also recognize that there are so many that still do not have a saving relationship with you. There may be some in our families, some in our close circles, even in our communities. And so, Lord, we're praying that as a church, that all that we do, everything we put forth, our energies and our focus would be to reach those who do not yet know you and to encourage those who are struggling in their walk with you so that, God, we can all be prepared so that we can all be ready to see you face to face. God, we think of those who are sick at this time, some who have made their requests known to have in the prayer corner. 
but also those who have not shared. We want to pray for them, God, that you would give healing. We know that you are the bomb in Gilead, and there is nothing that you as the great physician cannot do. So we ask, God, that you would minister to those who are sick physically and also those who are dealing with mental illness. Especially at a time like this, God, where depression and anxiety and mental health disorders are on the rise. Even suicide. Lord, we know that the mind is so integral to the well-functioning of the body and well-being and quality of life. And so, God, I pray that you would be able to meet those needs. And even, Lord, as we do our part with the Nedley program, we pray, God, that you would help us to get in touch with those who need, Lord, the help and the support. Father, we think of the fact that we have been able to continue to minister in our community through our community services team. And we thank God that, Lord, you have been opening doors and preparing the way so that we could be able to help minister to the needs in our community. And so, Lord, I pray that as we be your hands and feet, that as we do, Lord, what you have bid us to do, we pray that those souls who experience your love, may they see that you are the one working through us. That all that we do, it's not for ourselves. We do it because we love you. And we want people to have an opportunity to get to know you as well, to taste and see that God is good. Amen. Father, today I just ask that as we continue to worship you today, that, Lord, you would lift us up to higher planes. That you would introduce us once again to your heart. That you would show us the way, God. Some of us know the way or have heard of the way. But we want to be shown the way. And I pray, God, that as you reveal that to us, that we would be willing to follow where you lead. Be with each heart. Be with each individual. Be with us as we worship you today in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. God's story. God made people. So part of God's story is about how he made people, and it goes like this. The very beginning of time, God made the world, and he did it just by speaking. He made the blue sky and planets with rings and galaxies exploding with stars. He made puffy clouds and dry land and sparkling water. He covered the earth with deserts and mountains and planted forests and jungles. He sprinkled the world with flowers and bugs and birds and fish and animals of all kinds. It was a perfect home, full of fun creatures. And God called all of it good, but he wasn't done creating yet. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This time, though, God didn't just speak. First, he took some dust from the ground. Then he breathed into the dust with his own breath. By doing that, he created the very first person, a man called Adam. 
God put Adam in an amazing garden called Eden. But Adam was different than the other living creatures God had made. In fact, God put Adam in charge of everything else. But Adam needed a friend. So the Bible says that God caused him to fall into a deep sleep. While Adam was sleeping, God made a woman from one of Adam's ribs. Her name was Eve. And she and Adam were free to live happily in the garden where they could walk and talk with God. It was perfect. Once Adam and Eve were together caring for the garden, God didn't just call the world good, he called it very good. See, people are God's favorite. Remember, we were made in his own image, in his likeness. The Bible says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We don't know exactly what it means to be created in God's image, do know it means he made us like him. So our eyes, our skin, our teeth, our bones are perfectly crafted by God. Our personalities, our sense of humor, our sensitivities, our hobbies, our talents, everything is made by God so that we can be like him. And we have abilities that none of the animals have. We can paint pictures and write poems. We can solve math problems, explain what we're thinking, and invent cool new things. Whether we like to run, teach, build, or anything else, God understands us. Of course, we don't always act perfectly, but that's another part of the story. When God made Adam and Eve, he crafted them in his image. He made them, and us, like him. That's the story of how God made people. So, in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made the whole world. It was a perfect home. He called it good. He breathed into dust and made Adam. He took one of Adam's ribs and made Eve. Then he called the world very good. He made us like him, in his image. He understands us, and we are his favorite. And that's a part of God's story. Good morning, church. I pray that you're blessed by this song. When life lets you down and you feel all broken, then hold. When the grow deeper than words and you can't tell a soul I may not know what you're going through and may not can make that high mountain move but one thing I've found that I really want you to know if it matters to you it matters to the master he wants to share the burdens you bear whisper peace when your world gets shattered if it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain or your relief Friend, do you think the maker and giver of life is far too busy to care about your trouble and strife? Jesus, Christ. 
tears that don't make a sound if you only knew how precious you are in his sight if it matters to you it matters to the master he wants to share the burdens you bear whisper peace when your world gets shattered if it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain or your really needing an answer if it matters to you it matters to the master if it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain or your really needing an answer if it matters to you it doesn't only matter to you if it matters to you it matters to the master From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Amen. We praise God for this opportunity to be back in our church building once again. Amen. It is so nice to see each of you, and we welcome those joining us on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, we're so happy that you're here. We're happier with you than without you. And we hope and pray that you will have an enriching experience in the Lord today. I want to thank our platform party for leading out so effectively this morning throughout our worship service thus far. And we know that God is preparing us for a message that he has for us. I want to make mention that over these past few months, we have a few members from our church family that have been laid to rest in Christ. And we want to continue praying for the families of Margaret Brown, and Ray Fagan, and Helen Parsons. We pray that God would grant these families peace as they go through this time of grieving, as well as our church family as well. And we want all of you to know that you are in our thoughts, you are in our prayers, and we support you at this time for those family members that will be watching online. I also want to just make mention of our annual business meeting which will be happening tomorrow at 1 p.m. What time is that? 1 p.m. 1 p.m. tomorrow. We're going to be here in the church, and you're also able to join virtually for that. So we want all members, we're encouraging all members to join us for that as we look back at what God has done this past year and look ahead to see what God has in store for us in 2022, and also to catch a glimpse of where we are today as a church. So again, we encourage you to be here for that time. This is the time where we open God's word for the message, 
And before we get into the sermon, I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, have your way. This is your time. In Jesus' name, amen. The sermon is entitled, The Church, All Together Now. The Church, All Together Now. Have you ever found yourself, you set out to go and do a particular task, and, and as you were going to do that particular task, while you were on the way, uh, you forgot what you had set out to do. Has that ever happened to you before? It's not a nice feeling, is it? You've set your mind to do something. You've gone ahead to do it. But while you're on the way, you completely forget what you are going to do. You see, sometimes we get caught in the middle. We forget what we had planned to do, which results in us not accomplishing that important task. Sometimes in life, we forget the reason why we do things. We can forget the purpose of what we are called to do. We can find ourselves somewhere in between action and inaction. And it's not that we don't want to do it or that we are incapable of doing it. It's that we found ourselves somewhere in the middle. Now, some of us may attribute that to a nervous system disorder. Some of us may attribute that to just forgetfulness. And I tend to lean on the side that it's forgetfulness. Could it be that when we began our walk with the Lord, we were on fire? We knew where we were going. We knew our purpose and we knew the reason for our existence. We knew where to go because God was leading the way. But after some time has passed, the dust has settled, the music has stopped, and we have forgotten our purpose. You see, it's possible for us to find ourselves in such a position but is it remotely possible that a church can find itself here? This picture we've just painted of forgetfulness is exactly what we see when we look at the church in Corinth. The city of Corinth was known for its commercialism. Scholars estimate that the population of Corinth during the time of the apostles was somewhere between 500 and 700 thousand people, including Roman citizens and Greeks and foreigners. It was a place that everybody wanted to be. People would come from all around the world to witness the Isthmian Games, just like the Olympic Games, of which we know the Winter Olympic Games just finished a couple weeks ago. Paul went here as the gospel needed to be spread there, and he spent almost two years sharing the good news of the gospel, teaching and instructing and exhorting the people in the way of the Lord. He gave them clear direction from the word of God on how they were to live, on how they were to associate with one another, and how they were to work together, being the church that could transform the world. But after Paul had left and some years had passed, they completely forgot their purpose and their reason for being the church. They even went back to doing the same habits they did before they had met Jesus. When Paul was made aware of these concerns, he addressed each of them in his first letter to the church. 
He spoke about the divisions in the church and that people were taking sides and favoring certain people over another. He spoke to the misplaced worship where some people were worshiping animals rather than worshiping the God who created them. Some were engaged in sexual immorality. They were living their lives doing whatever they wanted to do with their bodies, completely forgetting that their bodies belonged to God. There were also distractions in the church that got louder and louder as time went on. And when Paul was made aware of these concerns, he did something noteworthy. He rectified all these issues by the leading of God's Spirit, by drawing the people back to the gospel. The same gospel message they fell in love with when they had first believed. The same gospel message that removes shackles of guilt and sin. The same gospel message that gives us eternal life and an abundant life. That same gospel message that is available for us today. Paul reminded them about the cross of Christ and the message of salvation. He taught them that a religion that is not practical is worthless. You see, there's no use in having all the information, but it has no effect on the life. God wants us to be hearers and doers of his word. And the church, as the body of believers, ought to be interconnected with Jesus and with one another. You know what I love over these past few years is that even though we haven't been able to meet in person as much as we would have liked due to the pandemic, we thank God for the Zoom and the YouTube because that has allowed us to stay connected with one another as a body of believers. You see, being able to still come together as a body shows us this very powerful truth, is that the church is not a building. It's a body of true believers. Furthermore, the church is not a business. It's the bride of Christ chosen by God. The church is not a corporation. It's a congregation of Christ's followers. The church is not a financial institution. It's a family. It's a flock. The church is not led by CEOs and managers. It's led by shepherds. Jesus being the good shepherd overseeing the under shepherds. Church is not built by corporate executives. It's built by Christ alone. As one songwriter says, in Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength and my source of hope is in Christ alone. Christ alone is where I find my strength. Christ is the one who's built the church. And in Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus says to Peter, he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, when we as a church come together and put together the plans that God is leading us to have, Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
When the Spirit is leading us to, to serve in our community, to minister to those who are in need, Jesus encourages us that the enemy will not be able to counteract those plans. Satan will attempt to disrupt, to distract, and even dismantle what God is trying to do. But Jesus has said that he will not succeed. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 tells us that Jesus is also the head of the body, the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. In other words, Jesus is in charge. And I'm so happy about that. I don't have to question that. I don't have to worry. I don't have any doubts. If Jesus is in charge, I can trust his plans. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 26 tells us that if one member suffers, we all suffer. And if one rejoices, we all rejoice. And this reality is true for the body of believers. I'm told that in Ukraine, there are 784 churches, 43,307 members. And in Russia, there are 451 churches and around 31,500 members in our church, in Seventh-day Adventist Church. And as we think about our church family over there, we want to pray for them. They are a part of the body. And so as they are going through a tough time, we go through it with them. And so we pray that God would intercede there. Because we oftentimes think of the church body as just the local church, or just the provincial church, or the national church, or the regional church. But it's a worldwide church that we're a part of. It's a worldwide movement. And so we empathize, we pray for them and support them at this time. The church is a body and we are never alone. And Paul reminds the members about this and instructs the church to remember their purpose individually, but also to remember their purpose as a church, as a body of believers. Our passage of scripture for examination this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us direction on how we are to function effectively as members in the body of Christ. Number one, we are to be a unified body. Number two, we are to be a diverse body. And number three, we are to be a balanced body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You see, God desires for his church to be united in one accord, working toward the same goals. Now, being united doesn't mean that we'll never have disagreements. It doesn't mean that we'll see eye to eye on everything. But it does mean that our mission and purpose are aligned. There's a quote that says, United we stand, and divided we fall. You see, when we are united, there is nothing that we can't do. You know, these are the same sentiments that God shares as we look at the Tower of Babel. You see, when the people came together to build this tower in an attempt to reach the heavens, the Bible says that their motivation was to make a name for themselves. It wasn't a God-ordained plan. 
But they had one thing going for them. They were united. And look at what God says in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6. God says, indeed the people are one and they have all one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Let me say that again. Nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. These people were all together as one. They were united and they were doing something that was not God ordained. And God said, nothing they propose to do will be withheld. Now imagine if we do something together, united, and it is God ordained. Can it be stopped? Not a chance. Not a chance. When we have God's leading, when we have God at the center and we are at the center of his will as a body of believers, there is nothing we can't do. And God provides infinite resources. Everything belongs to God. So whatever plans that we have, we remember that God has already told us he's willing to provide it. This metaphor of the body, of the church, also teaches us that we need each other. Like body parts that share the same blood and neural pathways and so forth, Christians belong to one another. We need each other in a way that we barely understand. There's a story, a fictional story, it says, one day it occurred to the members of the body that they were doing all the work while the belly had all the food. So they held an emergency meeting and decided to strike until the belly agreed to its proper share of the work. For a day or two, the hands refused to take the food. The mouth refused to receive it. And the teeth didn't chew it. After a few days, the members began to find that they themselves were in poor condition. The hands could hardly move and the mouth was parched, dry, and the legs were unable to support the rest. After this, the belly said to the hands and the mouth and the teeth and the legs, I need you as much as you need me. We all need each other. It became clear that even the belly was doing necessary work for the body. And all must unitedly work together or the body would fall apart. We all need each other. Our roles may look different, but we all work together for the cause of Christ. The body has different parts, many members, but one body functioning together for the furthering the gospel of Christ. You know, our world church, the General Conference, initiated uh, this call to action in 2016, and it stands for TMI. That's the acronym, TMI. Does anyone know what it stands for? Someone said it over here. Yes, total membership involvement. That's it. And that initiative has enabled churches all across the world to be actively engaged in serving God in our various communities. And here in St. John's, our responsibility is St. John's. And various churches their communities. And I think of how our church throughout this time of COVID has been able to minister and I can't say enough about our community services team. About how effective we have been ministering in the community and people have been so grateful and appreciative 
that we're not just offering food and support, but that we're there to pray for them. And we've added some into our prayer corner whenever they've asked for prayer requests. And so this is how we as a church have been able to minister to those around us who are in need. God wants us all, as a church, to be united locally, provincially, and all throughout the world as a body of believers. And we know that we have many others who are not of our denomination. Many other Christians out there as well. This is the body of Christ. Not only are we to be united to function effectively as a church, but we are also to recognize our diversity. Verses 28 to 30, the Bible says, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of, of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gift of healings? Do all speak with tongues? And do all interpret? You see, God in his perfect design has made us all different. And he has equipped all of us with different spiritual gifts. It's a blessing to celebrate diversity. Our eye colors are different. Our hair colors are different, right? We are all different. And that is something to celebrate. That is God's design. Now, the fact that we are different, it means that we have our own sense of individuality. No two people are the same. And that's what makes us unique. As the body of Christ and the body of believers, as we serve together, we may be taking on different roles, different assignments, different committees. But as long as we have the same goal, we will be fruitful under God's guidance. It's interesting, in anatomy and physiology, there's this idea called a force couple. And it's where two or more muscles on opposing sides of a joint work together to provide stability and create force to accomplish a task. The force couple is evident in arms and in legs. And we often hear that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. You see, that force couple, they, they move in opposite directions. But as they move, they're allowing the body to do what it was functioned to do. Provide stability and create force. And I believe this is what Paul is getting at when he speaks about diversity in the body of Christ. That even though we all have different gifts and that the body is made up of different parts, even if our roles look different and at times as if we are on opposite ends of each other, with God as our focus and with God leading the way, we are a force and a movement that cannot be stopped. Some of us may serve on a committee. Some of us may not serve on a committee. Some of us may be the hands, while some of us the toe. Some of us may be in roles that are inconspicuous, while others are in roles that are conspicuous. Whatever role you play, it matters to the body, to the church. And some think of unity and diversity as opposites. Two extremes. That if one stresses unity too much, then diversity is surely harmed. And if diversity becomes the watchword, then unity is threatened. 
But the reality that I believe is that the two work hand in hand. There's a balancing act. Need unity and diversity. We don't want to remove any of them. We can celebrate unity, and we can also celebrate diversity. This metaphor that Paul uses, I believe, is central in helping us understand the church. As one author says, God's living church has parts, but no parties. In other words, we are not in competition. We are not separate from one another. We are not in silos. We are all united as one with one common purpose. Sometimes we might think that one is more gifted than me. So I should stay back and let that person go. But I believe that we all have a purpose. We all have a role to fill. I believe that every Christian has a spiritual gift. Every single one of us. We may not know what the gift is. We may not have been told what the gift is. But everyone has a gift. The key ingredient is the willingness. The willingness to use the gift. And God wants all of us to be a part of the work. You see, sometimes we feel that perhaps the task we've been given is too difficult. Or perhaps that the task we've been serving in, the role that we've been serving in, gets challenging. And sometimes it does get challenging. But there's a way that God wants us to approach this. And I believe this will be an encouraging thought for you. If we turn to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, I invite you to turn there with me in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Matthew 24 and 14, the Bible tells us, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. You notice in that passage that it comes at the end of all these signs that Jesus has foretold will happen in the last days. But if you look and glance over that passage, you'll notice that nowhere in the passage is the subject. It doesn't tell us who is going to be doing the preacher. It just says that it will be preached. And I think sometimes we miss the power of this particular passage. Who is doing the preaching? You see, there is this understanding in Greek that whenever there is no subject to an action, God is the one performing the action. So in this particular passage where it doesn't show who is doing the preaching, the common understanding is that if there's no subject, God is the one. So what does that mean? It means that God is the one who's going to be doing the preaching that will bring in the end of this world. God is the one who will be finishing the work and preaching the three angels' messages to this world. God will be the one to preach the Sabbath more fully. God will be the one who will preach the final message of hope in this world. God is going to be the one to do the work. And I find that so encouraging that God is going to do the work and he's going to work through us if we are willing. And if God can't use us, if we are not willing, well, we know the stones will cry out. God will use whoever is willing. 
He will use whoever is willing to serve, whoever is willing to sing, whoever is willing to teach, whoever is willing to preach, whoever is willing to oversee, whoever is willing to do even the small tasks of the church. Whoever is willing, God will use them. It's not us using our gifts. It's God using his gifts through us. It doesn't matter how intimidating our assignment may be. Remember that God is the one working through you. Just let Jesus lead the way. A well-functioning church is to be united and diverse. We are also to be balanced. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 23, the Bible says, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow great honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Thank Leandro for reading that scripture reading for us. He did a great job. See, Paul was referring to the fact that some members who were in noteworthy roles were being exalted, were being uplifted, were getting all the notoriety and attention. And that those who were in less honorable roles were not being recognized. They were forgotten. And Paul is saying we should flip it in reverse. We should honor those and lift up those who serve behind the scenes, those who serve but don't care to have their name mentioned up front. Those who serve and no one knows that they're serving, they just do it because they love the Lord. We should honor those who visit the sick and don't ask for anything in return. Honor those who engage in personal ministry behind the scenes. Honor those who take the time to do the work that nobody else wants to do. Honor those who give their best. When the opportunity presents itself, they say, yes, I will do it. Because I love Jesus. The reason why we should not place anyone above another is because we are all unworthy. We see our true condition when we look at the cross. You see, Jesus was in the place that we should be in. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That is our condition. And it's not until we look at the cross and see the Savior lifted up and see the Savior nailed in our place. It's not until then that we see our true condition. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. We are all in the same position. That's why when people come in to the church we should treat them with love and compassion because we're all on the same level. That's why as a church the church is a hospital for sinners. For those who are hurting we are to be compassionate to them. Be enablers to them. Help them get to Jesus. There's a quote that says the church is the only institution that exists for those outside of it. And this was the philosophy that we find that Jesus had in his ministry. He reached those who did not know him. He spent more time outside the church walls than inside the church walls. Jesus had a balanced ministry. He excelled in the ministry of presence. In the streets where the blind, lame, and sick reside, he was there. 
in the homes of those who were categorized as sinners. He was there in the synagogue every Sabbath as his custom was. He was there in Gethsemane when his disciples fell asleep. He went to prayer meeting. No one else was there, but Jesus was there. He never missed the opportunity to be present for those who needed him the most. Jesus was there. And I believe there are moments when sometimes we don't need to have all the answers. We just need to be there just to be present. Praise God. All of you decided to be here today those online as well. As a church, I believe that balance is important. Just like in the body, we have pH levels that need to be balanced. There are even times when I've heard it said that there are parts of the body that we don't necessarily need. Maybe you've heard that before as well. Certain organs we don't really need. Floating ribs, You don't really need those. But I like to think that every part of the body is important. Even the floating ribs. Because we recognize that there are primary ribs. Those are important. There are secondary ribs. That is important as well. But even the floating ribs. Even though the protection they provide may be tertiary, it's still important. No matter what role we play, we all matter. As a church, when we come together for the service of God, let us remember, let us esteem others higher than ourselves. Let us remember the fact that God wants us to prove what is acceptable before the Lord. A bigger role smaller role. Let us uplift, recognize, and encourage each other for whatever we do for the body of Christ. There's a story of an organist that played one of the old organs that had pipes. We needed someone in the back to pump the pipes in order for the music to play. And as the organist would would play in front of large crowds, stadium-filled crowds, he would receive loud applause, standing ovation from the audience. But his helper, the one who would be working and pumping in the back, never got any recognition. One day as the organist went to play and with everyone watching, he played the music but nothing came out, no sound. He tried again, and still no sound. So with the audience there waiting, he said, I'll be right back. And he rushed to the back, and to his surprise, he found his helper there sitting down, and arms crossed, and head bowed down. So he said, what's wrong? What happened? And the boy said, you always go up front. And you don't acknowledge me. You don't even mention me. Because I don't feel like I'm appreciated. I work back here all by myself. I work hard. But I never get acknowledged. The musician, the organist took some time, reflected on it for a few moments, and apologized. And said, going forward, I will call you up. When I go to stand up, I will call you up with me before the audience. The organist went back out to play. And the boy pumped like he never pumped before. And it was a wonderful show. And at the end of the show, as he went up to stand before the audience, he called his helper out with him. And hand in hand, they bowed before the crowd as the crowd applauded and roared before them. 
You see, this is what happens, church family, when we come together, when we celebrate each other, when we show that as long as God is what we are focused on, it doesn't matter what we are doing. Each person, each role matters. The body of Christ is a movement. And we go faster alone, but we go farther together. This is what the church is all about. We are to be unified, diverse, and balanced, following God's leading. And though it is possible sometimes to forget, to get in a routine, forget why we exist. Let us remember the reason why we exist is to reach those who are not yet followers of Jesus. To reach those who need the love and compassion of Christ. The time is now for us to come together. The time is now for us to give our best. The time is now for us to remember and return to the first works. The time is now for us to be the sermon and follow the footsteps of Jesus. Let God be our guide. Let's allow God to lead the way, serving together, growing together, and encouraging one another along the way. Say brother and sister round here It's because we're a family And these folks are so near When one has a heartache We all share the tears And rejoice in this victory in this family so near I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by His blood Joy dears with Jesus as we travel
you're glad to be a part of the family of God, why don't you stand with me as we pray? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, so grateful to be a part of this family. We're thankful, God, that we have one another that we can lean on in difficult times. But Lord, there's always someone thinking of us, praying for us. And we know that of God, God, you are always praying for us as well. And Lord, I just pray today for all our individuals here, all our officers as well, that are continuing to serve in their roles for this term and even new officers, that God, you would fill us with your spirit, that we would see the opportunity to serve as a privilege, and that, Lord, it would be an encouragement to those who want to know what their spiritual gifts are, who want to be more involved, and just, Lord, need an encouragement. And I pray, God, that as we continue to look at your Son, Jesus Christ, that it would reveal to us that, God, you died for the church. You gave your life for the church. That lets us know that you love your church so much. So, God, may we continue to look to you that we may not forget our purpose, that we will keep our eyes on you and be focused on the prize that is before us, which is to spend eternal life with you. Thank you, Jesus, for the message. Thank you for our worship service. And may you continue to bless us as we go throughout the week. In Jesus' name, amen.